So in this chapter, we mainly look at various factors that have impact on decisions involving whether a supply chain activity is carried out within the company or it should be outsourced. So purchasing is also called procurement and it involves processes that help to acquire raw material or components and other things that a company acquires from their suppliers. Sourcing is entire set of processes that are needed to purchase goods and services. And when a supply chain function is performed by a third party or outside company, we call it outsourcing. So if you look at various companies, you may notice that these companies uh, adopt various type of strategies when it comes to sourcing. For example, if you look at WW Granger, they own distribution centers, but they outsource transportation. So what are the factors uh, that influence such a decision making at Granger? So that question comes to our mind. If you look at Dell, they outsource retailing to Walmart since 2007. So before that, they used to perform this activity themselves. Similarly, if you look at Apple, so every now and then we hear that they have opened an Apple store in US or some outside country. What factors affect such kind of decision making again is interesting to look into. Procter & Gamble outsource retailing. These are the type of questions we like to answer when we go through this chapter. So making effective sourcing decisions has many benefits. So by identifying the right source, a business can help to have a higher quality and lower cost. It can also help to have better economies of scale if the orders can be aggregated. If procurement processes can be made efficient, it can help to reduce the overall cost of purchasing. Design collaborations can also help in lowering overall cost, especially when a company is purchasing such components from a supplier which are very expensive. Effective sourcing decisions can also help to facilitate coordination with suppliers and improve forecasting and planning, lower inventories and also improved matching of supply and demand. So when a company is ready to share risk and also benefits with the supplier, so that can have positive impact in terms of higher profits for both supplier and the buyer. So whether to conduct a supply chain activity in-house or whether it should be outsourced. So in situations where decision to outsource a supply chain activity helps to increase supply chain surplus and reduce the risk involved. So that is the ideal situation to go for outsourcing. Third parties increase surplus through various ways. A third party may be able to aggregate uh, demand from several different uh, firms and achieve economies of scale in production, especially in situations where a single company cannot achieve that kind of economies of scale on its own. Another way third parties increase surplus is via inventory aggregation. One such example is WW Granger. So they are able to aggregate inventory for hundreds of thousands of customers and thereby increasing the supply chain surplus. Next one is transportation aggregation by transportation intermediaries. So one good example of this is UPS. So they increase supply chain surplus by aggregating transportation across a variety of shippers. So when manufacturers are looking to send small quantities, so these uh, transportation intermediaries such as UPS or FedEx can aggregate shipments across multiple shippers. And this is how they can lower the cost of each shipment, which is not possible to do if uh, each company has to transport their products individually to each customer. On the other hand, if you look at example of Walmart, so transportation aggregation by a third party may not be good idea for Walmart because their shipment sizes are already quite large and they are already able to achieve aggregation across many retail stores that they have. Another way is to have transportation aggregation by storage intermediaries. So again, companies like uh, WW Granger or McMaster Car, what they do is they stock uh, products from more than thousands of manufacturers and then sell to hundreds of thousands of customers. 
so on the inbound side they are able to aggregate uh, items from several manufacturers and when you look at the outbound side again they are able to aggregate packages for customers at a common destination and this is how they are able to significantly reduce transportation cost another way third parties increase surplus is through warehousing aggregation so one example is safe express safe express owns several warehouses that are distributed across the country and they serve many different customers and these customers uh, individually do not have warehousing needs that are really big enough to justify having a warehouse of their own such a warehousing aggregation by a third party adds supply chain surplus for small suppliers and also for those companies who are beginning to do some business in different uh, geographic uh, location but if you look at companies like walmart amazon or granger they have a sufficiently large uh, warehousing needs of their own and that's why they create their own warehouses they don't depend on warehousing by third parties because it is not really going to help them increase supply chain surplus another way to increase surplus is procurement aggregation and this is a uh, very effective especially in situations where there are many small buyers and if we take example of india where we have small retailers who purchase uh, items or goods from distributors that aggregate buying from manufacturers so such procurement aggregation is not likely to be significant in situation where there are a few large customers so once again if we take example of walmart so they already have sufficient scale where they can do their own procurement and it is not likely to help them to improve supply chain surplus if they get a procurement done from a third party next one is information aggregation so one example of this is ebags so ebags is a online retailer that provides information aggregation they actually carry very little inventory but they provide a single point where they can display information on bags from many manufacturers it helps online customers in a significant way because instead of going to many different places online in search of bags they just go to one place and get all the information about various manufacturers and save time next is receivable aggregation so again if you take example of distributors in india so distributors in india are able to aggregate across many companies or many manufacturers and small retailers and in this way they are able to increase supply chain surplus so this situation actually is feasible mostly in developing countries where retailing is still fragmented but if you look at developed countries like united states where retailing is mostly consolidated it is not likely to really help increase supply chain surplus in a big way relationship aggregation so if you just take a simple example where let's say we have two manufacturers and let's say we have these customers here these manufacturers have relation with each one of these customers so basically we have like eight uh, different combinations between these two manufacturers and four customers but if we change the situation where these two manufacturers work with the distributors somewhere in between so they don't have to worry about directly coordinating with the customer they only coordinate with the distributor and distributor takes care of all the four customers so this way there is a relationship aggregation possible which can help improve supply chain surplus and lastly a third party can increase supply chain surplus by having lower cost and higher quality so for example uh, most of the manufacturing for apple products like iphone or ipad is done at a company called foxconn in china where they have lower labor cost and that helps to increase supply chain surplus for companies like apple
now let's look at what are the factors influencing growth of surplus by a third party so one of the factors is specificity of assets involved in function so if the assets that are required are specific to a company and if uh, those items cannot be used by any other company and if that situation is on a higher rate so this is not going to really help in growing the supply chain surplus so you can see whether a firm has low scale or high scale or whether there is a demand uncertainty for a firm which is at a low level or high level we always have low to medium growth in surplus and especially when the scale is high no growth is expected unless cost of capital is lower so this is because the third party has no opportunity to aggregate across other customers because these items or assets are so specific that they serve purpose only for that particular company so if we have a situation where specificity is low so items are not being made specific to a company and also that company has let's say low scale that is the ideal situation to have to go for outsourcing or to go to a third party because it will lead to high growth in surplus but if the scale is high if the scale is already high for example walmart so walmart already has large enough scale in terms of transportation needs that they will not really gain much by going to a third party to have their transportation needs fulfilled so growth expected is very low if you look at the third factor which is a demand uncertainty for the firm so if our demand uncertainty is low which also means that the demand is more or less predictable so in those situations uh, we expect low to medium growth in surplus and this is all the more true when a company has sufficient scale on the other hand if uh, the demand uncertainty is quite high in those situations third party can definitely increase the surplus through aggregation with other customers so to summarize a company can gain maximum by going to the third party if its needs are small highly uncertain and also shared by other companies who are sourcing from the same third party so although there are benefits of going to a third party in many situations there are situations where it is risky to go with the third party before using services of a third party a company obviously has to carefully evaluate situations and make decision so one of the situations uh, where a company decides to do outsourcing or they go to third party is when they have a process which is broken so if there is a process uh, which is broken within the company and when we introduce a third party to it things can become more complicated and even more difficult to control so before going to a third party it is always wise to first fix the problem in house and bring the process under control and then evaluate and see what are the costs involved what is the benefit of going to the third party and then make a decision underestimation of the cost of coordination so sometimes uh, businesses only look at the face value of the cost involved and totally underestimate the cost related to coordination issues that may crop up so one example is nike and i2 technologies so they had uh, coordination issues uh, in 2000 where nike blamed 100 million dollars in losses on inventory management glitches which they attributed to i2 technologies but i2 in turn blamed the problem on nike's uh, execution of the software they reason that the way the software was used was not proper and that's why they cannot be blamed for that problem so obviously lack of coordination created a big problem for these two companies another risk is reduced customer supplier contact so situations where a manufacturer is uh, dealing directly with the customer and then you change the situation where somebody in between comes and you are dealing with that maybe distribution center or some third party and this third party now deals with the customer so obviously this reduces customer supplier contact so in some situations that may become a big risk another risk is loss of internal capability and growth in third party power so when a supply chain activity is shifted to a third party 
and they develop expertise in manufacturing it or transporting it so obviously they gain in power and when they are dealing with the several manufacturers they might use this power in certain way so there could be some risk involved in letting the power shift from the manufacturer to the third party leakage of sensitive data and information there are businesses uh, that have lot of sensitive data and when this sensitive uh, information is shared by third party there is always some amount of risk involved for example if a credit card company gets uh, some of its activity done by a third party and this third party has access to data such as credit card numbers information about the customers so obviously that is a very critical information and if there is a leakage of such uh, sensitive uh, data so that can create big problems another risk is when there are ineffective contracts so there could be situations where a contract uh, does not really motivate a third party to make improvements or reduce cost another risk is loss of supply chain visibility so when a business uh, introduces a third party so that obviously reduces the visibility of the supply chain operations and such a loss of visibility can really be harmful for supply chains that are very long the last one here is negative reputational impact so if the third party involves itself in certain activities which may be damaging to the manufacturer and that may bring bad name to those companies so for example a manufacturer may be located in a developed country where there are very strong rules to protect employees of companies but uh, such rules may not be there at a third party which might be operating in a third world countries or developing countries and they might use underage workers or they may not pay them wages in time so all these can bring bad name to manufacturer that uses that third party one common error that many businesses make when choosing a supplier is that they only look at the initial price quoted by the supplier so it is like when you want to buy a second hand car and let's say the quoted price is $2000 and you look at various cars and find that okay $2000 seems to be quite less and make a decision to buy that car but within 3 months you may find that it has many problems you may have to change the entire engine because there was some problem with that so although initial cost may be small but what matters more is what is the total cost of ownership so instead of only looking at supplier price it is more wise to look at various other costs that are associated with making a decision of outsourcing a supply chain function so if you look at uh, acquisition cost so that may include all the cost that are associated with purchase of the material from a supplier until it reaches the buyer and it is ready for use some of the costs are listed here apart from supplier price you also have what are the supplier terms and conditions are there any taxes or duties that need to be paid what is the delivery cost incoming quality cost and also management cost if you look at ownership cost so this includes all those costs that are associated with the purchased item from the time it arrives from the supplier to the time when finished product is sold to the customer so it can involve inventory cost if we have to carry inventory if it needs warehousing so that also is to be included manufacturing cost production quality cost cycle time cost similarly there are costs associated with post ownership cost so this includes all the cost incurred by the company after the finished product has reached the end customer so these costs could involve cost associated with reputation of the company cost associated with paying for warranty or product liability there could be environmental costs and also cost associated with supplier capabilities so one example from 2007 is of metal they announced uh, many major recall of toys that were made in china and were contaminated with lead paint so they had hired a subcontractor who used uh, non authorized paint and metal announced actually a cost of about 30 million dollars involving the recall that they had to do and the company was also fined about 2.3 million dollars by the consumer product safety commission 
So this is the cost uh, they had to pay, but the cost associated with the reputation of the company, so that is very hard to quantify. So obviously they paid not only in terms of dollars, but also in terms of high cost involving loss in reputation. So when making uh, such kind of decisions, it is important to look at all these costs and sometimes a higher acquisition cost is more than compensated by lower ownership and post ownership cost. So supplier selection also involves auctions and negotiations. But before that can be done, a company has to decide whether they want to go for single sourcing or multiple sourcing. So one example of single sourcing is in automotive industry, they make use of seats. So that must arrive at a particular time during the assembly. But note that they may have a single sourcing for one plant. But when you involve various uh, vehicle lines, each plant may have single sourcing. But across the plant, obviously, they may go for multiple sourcing. The reason being that if all the plants uh, go with the same supplier for seating systems, so that also increases risk because if due to any reason supplier is not able to provide uh, those seats, so all the plants will suffer. But when they have multiple sourcing where one sourcing for each plant, so that reduces this risk to some amount. So once a decision is made about whether a company wants to do single sourcing or multiple sourcing, then the selection can be done using offline competitive bids, reverse auctions or direct negotiations. And note that the supplier selection should be based on total cost of using a supplier. In situations where acquisition cost is the primary component of the total cost, so auctions are the best option and auctions will not be appropriate if ownership or post ownership costs are very high. So in those situations, it is better to go with direct negotiations. So difference between the value of the buyer and the seller is called the bargaining surplus. So note that the value that a buyer places on performing an activity is influenced by the cost of performing that particular activity in-house and also the price that is available from various suppliers. Similarly, the value that a seller or supplier places on performing a particular activity or a function is influenced by the cost as well as other alternatives that are available for its existing capacity. When you take the difference between the two, that's what gives us the bargaining surplus. So the goal of each negotiating party is to ideally grow the surplus. Have a clear idea of your own value and as good as an estimate of the third party's value as possible. So that is going to be the best starting point in any type of negotiation. So if uh, such estimates are available, that will clearly improve the chances that there will be a successful outcome. So one example is uh, Toyota. So Toyota's uh, suppliers gave a lot of credit to Toyota for successful negotiations. And in fact, uh, some of them quote that uh, Toyota knows our cost better than we do. This obviously leads to better negotiation and it also helps to grow the surplus for both Toyota and its suppliers. And the next one is to look for a fair outcome based on equally or equitably dividing the bargaining surplus. So basically the idea is that both the parties should win. If the outcome is win-win, that obviously can be treated as a successful negotiation. But if one party feels that they are losing and the other one wins, so that may not be good for long term. So main problem to a win-win outcome generally arises when the two parties involved are negotiating on a single dimension. For example, the price. So if both parties negotiate on more than one item or more than one issue, the chances of a win-win outcome increases. Also, one way to solve this problem is not to look at just the price but the total cost of ownership and then identify various areas where both parties feel that they have a chance to win.
So far, we have been looking at a situation where we want to grow the supply chain surplus while making a decision about whether a supply chain activity should be performed in-house or by a third party. Now, the other aspects involve how do we share risk and reward in the supply chain? So, we know that uh, independent actions by two parties often result in lower profits than what could be achieved. And at the same time, we also see sometimes that between the two parties, a stronger party, they tend to push risk on the supply chain partners. But that has a negative impact on growth of supply chain surplus. So, let's look at the impact of local optimization using this example here. So this is about a music store that sells CDs. So manufacturing cost uh, for these CDs is $1. So the manufacturer sells them to the music store for about $5. And then the music store is able to sell these CDs to customers for about $10. And if these uh, CDs are not sold, so let's say they become worthless. Suppose the mean demand is about 1000 CDs with a standard deviation of about 300. So basically we want to make a decision that how many CDs this uh, music store should buy from the manufacturer. And also we want to find out what will be the supply chain profit if we treat a retailer as independent and what will be the profit if manufacturer and the retailer are vertically integrated. So they don't uh, operate as two different companies, but they operate as a single company. So the cost of overstocking is the difference between these two numbers. They are purchased for $5 each, but if they are not sold, then they are worthless. So that difference is $5. Similarly, cost of understocking is also $5. So that's the opportunity loss. So music store could have made additional $5 if they had these uh, CDs available in the stock. So using these uh, two, we can calculate target service level and it comes to 0.5. So this is the optimal service level that the music store can aim for. So using this, uh, they can order. So you can make use of normal distribution and look at the target uh, service level. And this is the average demand. This is the standard deviation. So this will give us 1000 CDs. And then if you apply the expected profit formula, which makes use of these numbers and also normal distribution, I have entered these uh, values in this Excel file. Here you can change values that are yellow in color. So once we enter that, it does the calculation for expected profit automatically. So I have entered formula here using the formula on the PowerPoint. So after calculating these four values, using normal distribution. I just take some of these four numbers and get 3803.17. So since these are dollars, I'm going to click on dollars. So 3803 and 17 cents. So that will give us an expected profit of about $3,803. Remember manufacturer cost is $1 and the wholesale price is $5. So they make $4 on every CD. So if 1000 CDs are sold, so 1000 times 4 is $4,000. Total supply chain profit comes to $7,803. So this is based on local optimization. So music store is trying to optimize their profit and the manufacturer is trying to optimize their own profit. Now let's see what will happen if we do a vertically integration related calculation. So same company manufactures as well as sells these CDs. So manufacturing cost is $1, wholesale price is still 5 and retail is 10. So mean demand is still 1000 and standard deviation 300. If this company carries a CD that is not sold, so because manufacturing cost is only $1, so that is the only loss they will have. So this is going to be the cost and the cost of understocking. So if a customer comes looking for a CD and it is not available, that's the difference between 1 and 10 here. So that's about $9. So if you do the calculation for target service level, it comes to now 0.9. So with that 0.9, if we do the calculation for 
the best or optimal order it's about 1384 cds using the formula used earlier we can find that the total supply chain profit is 8474 if you take difference between the total supply chain profit for these two situations the difference comes to about 670 dollars basically vertically integrated supply chain gains by about 670 dollars compared to situation where the music store and the manufacturer of this music cds they work independently sharing the risk across the supply chain can help to grow the supply chain profits there are three approaches to this buyback or returns or revenue sharing by the two companies or having quantity flexibility so we can assess the performance of each by asking these three questions first one is how will risk sharing affect the firm's profits and total supply chain profits will risk sharing introduce any information distortion and number 3 is how will risk sharing influence supplier performance along key performance measures so let's look at the buybacks so buybacks allows a retailer to return unsold inventory up to a specified amount at an agreed upon price so in the buyback contract what you'll see is that the manufacturer specifies a wholesale price c and a buyback price b so instead of having only this now you also have another data point which is b and also the manufacturer can salvage sm dollars for any units that the retailer returns and then the manufacturer has a cost of v per unit and the retail price is p so using these numbers we can estimate expected manufacturing profit using this formula here so if we consider the same example of a music company which uh, manufactures cds and now we introduce this uh, buyback price of $3 so music store buys these cds for $5 but the manufacturer of these cds says that they are ready to buy any unsold cd at $3 so now the cost of overstocking is $2 similarly cu which is the cost of understocking is still 10 minus 5 so it is $5 so we can now recalculate target service level using these numbers and we get a value of 0.71 which gives optimal order quantity of about 1170 cds if you use the formula we get expected profit of 4286 expected overstock is about 223 and manufacturing profit when you take into account uh, this buyback cost is 4011 so the total supply chain profit is about 8297 now we can see that this uh, risk sharing using buyback for $3 increases the profits for retailer as well as manufacturer so this table here gives a simulation for different values of wholesale price c and different buyback prices b so if you consider this constant uh, wholesale price of $5 and as we increase the buyback price from 0 to 2 to 3 so remember buyback price of 0 means that the manufacturer and the music store they work independently and that we have seen gives us a value of 7803 but with buyback cost of $2 the profits increase to 8125 and they go further up with the $3 buyback price so as the buyback price goes up for a constant whole price you can see the music store makes more and more profits for the supplier profits increase however after certain buyback value they slightly decrease when the wholesale price is $6 and if we increase the buyback price from 0 to 2 to 4 you can see that the music store continues to improve their profits and same thing is true for supplier also so overall supply chain profit uh, increases as the buyback price increases when the wholesale price is higher compared to $5 if you go further up to $7 for wholesale price and now you see a bigger jump in uh, buyback prices 0 to 4 to 6 so this is always going to help the music store make more profit but not only music store makes more profit 
the supplier also makes more and more profit because they are able to sell more and more CDs. So this is like win-win for both manufacturer as well as the retailer. So we have seen that uh, it benefits both of them, but there could also be a downside to the buyback. And the downside is that it can lead to surplus inventory, sometimes uh, which needs to be salvaged or totally disposed. The task of returning these unsold items increases the supply chain cost also. So sometimes uh, what uh, suppliers do is to eliminate this cost of uh, returning items or returning these uh, unsold items, supplier or the manufacturer give retailer a markdown allowance. This allows retailers to sell those items at a discount. So for example, nowadays uh, publishers do not ask retailer to return unsold books. Instead of that, they give them a markdown allowance and retailers are able to sell these books at a heavy discount. So another type of contract is revenue sharing contract where a manufacturer charges the retailer low wholesale price C but then also shares a fraction F of the retailer's revenues. So for example a wholesale price of $5 for the CDs so instead of that the CD manufacturer may go for a lower value but then they may have a contract where they share the fraction of whatever profits the retailer makes. So this allows both the manufacturer and the retailer to increase their profits. So you can see like in this situation, uh, manufacturer is sharing the risk with the retailer. Like what happens if these CDs are not sold because manufacturer is offering them at a lower wholesale price. So risk to the retailer is also low. So if you compare uh, revenue sharing with the buyback contracts, so one advantage is that no product needs to be returned. So this totally eliminates the cost of returns. And uh, it also makes it ideal in situations where products have low variable cost and high cost of return. One example is where Blockbuster Video Rentals, so they had this kind of contract with the movie studios where the studios they sold uh, each movie cassette to Blockbuster at a very low price and then shared in the revenue. Because the price was low, Blockbuster will purchase them in bulk. They will purchase many copies and that will increase the rentals and that will lead to higher profits for both Blockbuster and the studios. Revenue sharing contracts obviously results in lower retailer effort and it requires information infrastructure. So because now the supplier should be able to monitor the sales at the retailer. So how many CDs are getting sold that should be known to manufacturer also. Such infrastructure can be expensive to develop in certain situations. So because of that reason this model of uh, revenue sharing contracts uh, may be difficult to manage in situations uh, where a supplier is selling to many small buyers. Both in buyback contract and revenue sharing contract what can happen is a manufacturer so they may use retailer orders to develop a production forecast instead of actual customer orders and this can lead to information distortion which can result in excess inventory in the supply chain and a greater mismatch between supply and demand so if you use the same example of uh, music cds to revenue sharing so wholesale price is one dollar so much lower than five dollars that we saw earlier and suppose revenue sharing percentage is about 45 percent so 45 percent of the revenue goes to manufacturer and 55 percent of the revenue goes to retailer so remember that the music cds are sold for ten dollars 0.45 means four dollars and fifty cents are kept by manufacturer and $5.50 goes to the retailer. 
So if you calculate uh, cost of overstocking, so that is about one dollar. Cost of understocking that gives us four dollar and fifty cents. And using that, we can calculate target service level point eight one eight. That gives us an optimal order quantity of one thousand two hundred and seventy three. CDs and using the formula you can find that the expected profit is 4369 manufacturer profit is 4068 and the total now comes to 8437 so you can notice that this wholesale price of $1 and profit sharing of 45% increases this number here for both manufacturer and retailer so if we simulate uh, different numbers for revenue sharing contracts so you can compare here when you have one dollar as wholesale price much below five dollar value that we had initially when the revenue sharing fraction increases from 30 percent to 45 and 60 percent so you can see optimal order size for the music store goes down this is increase in profit for the manufacturer also expected overstock at uh, music store goes down revenue sharing fraction is improving for the supplier you can see the profits are going up for the supplier but it is going down for the music store so the expected supply chain profit is the highest at the 30 percent uh, revenue sharing but if wholesale price is two dollars and we have a similar structure for revenue sharing you can see there is a further drop in overall supply chain profits. So basically it means that if revenue sharing fraction is more in favor of the music store or the retailer rather than the manufacturer, supply chain profits are likely to be higher. But if a revenue sharing fraction is more favorable to the manufacturer, then the supply chain profit is likely to go down. Now the next approach is the risk sharing using quantity flexibility. So this situation allows the buyer, in this case the music store, to modify the order within certain limits of course after observing the demand. So this helps to have a better matching between supply and demand. So chances that there will be understock situations or overstock situations, so that will reduce. Increased overall supply chain profits if the suppliers has flexible capacity and also lower levels of information distortion that we see in buyback contract or revenue sharing contract. Retailers orders with O units initially. Using that, manufacturer commits to quantity up to Q and retailer commits to a quantity up to a small Q. So they are ready to buy at least this number and where this alpha and beta are both between 0 and 1. So basically a retailer can purchase any number between lower Q and capital Q. So that's the flexibility they get under this model. So if the demand is less, obviously it will tend to be around this. If the demand is more, then they will tend to purchase around this number. So the formula that are used for making the calculations are given here. Let's look at one example. So this is the manufacturing cost this is the wholesale price and this is the price at which a retailer sells the CDs and suppose a supplier agrees to these numbers for alpha and beta and suppose the retailer decides to place an order of 1017 CDs so we can do the calculation for small Q and big Q we get a value of 966 and 1000 68 so expected quantity purchased by retailer is 1015 expected quantity sold by retailer is 911 and expected overstock is about 104 cds and this gives us a expected retailer profit of 4038 dollars and manufacturer profit of 4007 and the total comes to about 8045 so you can see that in this case where we have a quantity flexibility of about 5% above and below so that increases profit for both manufacturer in this case and also the music store so if we simulate this over different values of A and B 
first one being the base case where there is no risk sharing and the supply chain profit is 7803 so if you look at the situation where the flexibility is 5% above and below the order quantity and 20% above and below the order quantity with 5% flexibility retailer makes about 4038 which is higher compared to no risk situation and manufacturer also makes more four dollar more than what they may have made without sharing the risk overall supply chain profit goes up similarly with more flexibility like 20 percent up and down retailer can make even more profit and supplier loses a bit here but overall supply chain profit remains same as the previous one now if we go to wholesale price of six dollars so in the base case, uh, the total supply chain profit is 7,461. And if we change the quantity flexibility from 20% to 30% up or down, you can see the profits for the entire supply chain goes up. If we go further up to $7 and for the base case, we have 7,013. But with risk sharing, you can see profits go up as high as 8473. So the key points are risk sharing in a supply chain increases profits for both supplier and the retailer and the risk sharing mechanisms that we have seen are buybacks, revenue sharing. So these two have some amount of information distortion but then we have also seen quantity flexibility that can also be used as an option. So quantity flexibility contracts they result in lower information distortion compared to buyback or revenue sharing contracts especially when suppliers sells to multiple buyers or the supplier has excess flexible capacity contracts to induce performance improvements one example is reducing let's say lead time so lead time between the order is placed and when the order comes in previous slides we have seen how risk sharing helps the supply chain in improving the profits now let's look at importance of sharing rewards in the supply chain a buyer may want performance improvement from a supplier who otherwise would have little incentive to do so so they can have a shared savings contract which provides the supplier with the fraction of the savings that result from performance improvement so without uh, this kind of contract a supplier may not be really interested in making an improvement a similar situation can also occur when a buyer wants supplier to improve the quality so improving quality involves time and resources some people have to work on it uh, for maybe two three months and find ways to improve quality although the buyer would like a supplier to have such kind of improvements because it will reduce buyers cost but it will require more resource deployment by the supplier so once again a shared saving contract can help to motivate both the key players apart from decisions involving whether to do something in-house or outsource a company may also have to decide whether to go for cost efficiency or responsiveness so this uh, table identifies several factors that favor selection of a responsive or a low-cost source so generally a low cost supplier will be given high orders so volume will be high and the product is likely to be in a mature phase and these products are likely to have low value low rate of product obsolescence and low demand volatility also engineering and design support required is likely to be low and desired quality is low to medium on the other hand for responsive suppliers it will be opposite so these items are likely to be of high value but low in demand and demand volatility is likely to be high rate of product obsolescence because this is like early phase is likely to be high desired quality with these new products are likely to be high and it also needs high engineering and design support so many of the companies go for tailoring their requirements for example if you look at zara so they make use of responsive sources out of Europe to produce products which are trendy in nature because these are fashion related items they have to be in store quickly to meet uh, customer demand 
on the other hand if you look at some of the basic uh, stuff they sell like t-shirts so they are sourced out of low cost facilities in asia so basically they make use of a tailored portfolio which is a combination of responsiveness and low cost another decision that they need to make is where this supplier should be from it could be on source near shore or offshore onshore refers to producing items or products in the market where it is sold near shore means producing items or products that are at lower cost location but they are near the market so for example for us market mexico or canada will be regarded as near shoring and offshore refers to producing items or products at low cost locations that may be far from the market so this uh, table gives an idea when to favor onshoring when to favor near shoring and when to favor offshoring so for example when rate of innovation and product variety is high so onshoring is likely to be a better option compared to offshoring similarly when labor content is high it will make more sense to do offshoring especially when labor cost is very high when inventory costs are high it will make more sense to go for onshoring so when doing tailoring of supplier portfolio it is also useful to look at whether we are dealing with direct materials or indirect materials so direct materials are components that are used to make finished goods for example a fuel injector may be required to make a engine on the other hand indirect materials are goods that are used to support operations of a company office supplies for example will come under indirect material so the differences between direct materials and indirect materials are listed in this table taking into account the different factors so generally direct materials will be used in production whereas indirect may be used for maintenance repair and support operations accounting is cost of goods sold for direct materials whereas for indirect material it is selling general and administrative expenses impact on production so any delay will delay the production so for example if it is a car assembly so even if one component is missing we may not be able to complete the assembly so it will delay the whole process whereas indirect materials are not likely to have any direct impact processing cost related to value of transportation generally is low for direct material but for indirect it could be high number of transactions like how often you buy direct material generally frequency is going to be low but quite high for indirect material so given the importance of uh, direct material and also the impact they have on production suppliers for direct material they should be selected very carefully and their ability to collaborate and coordinate across the supply chain also should be seen very carefully if you look at indirect materials they are generally a very small fraction of dollars that is spent by any company but it obviously can be a big uh, task for the purchasing or procurement department especially considering number of transactions are quite high so generally when selecting uh, suppliers for indirect material lot of importance should be given to those suppliers who have the ability to simplify the process so in addition to the two categories that we saw for direct and indirect material all the products uh, that are purchased by a company can also be classified into these four categories so based on what is the value or cost and also how critical these items are so those items uh, which are low in value and low in criticality can be termed as general items whereas those in low value and high criticality can be termed as critical items so generally critical items may involve those that have very high lead times so under those situations the focus is not on having a low price but the focus is more on availability so a manufacturer is obviously looking at those suppliers who are more responsive even if they are high cost but if you look at strategic items which are high value as well as critical 
So generally, buyer and the supplier relationship for these kind of items has to be long term. And because of that, the supplier should be evaluated more on the lifetime cost and not the initial price. So very often, a manufacturer also expects uh, these suppliers to take part in design and manufacturing. And bulk purchase items are those which have high value, but that may not be critical.